hosted by Mike, the hey, big Pat, this is Mike. How are you? I'm great. How are you, sir? Oh, I'm doing fantastic, Pat. I have to tell you, I go back to you from the Gorgal days, man, when 1985 was that first demo tape. It's been a long oh, time. <laughs> yeah, Gargoyle, man. That was some stuff back then. I followed you ever since, and I can't tell you how happy I am that after like 20 years, you decided it was time, you know, to go back to Diesel Machine. Yeah, well, you know, we had some material sitting there in the can, and we had a couple of new ideas to play with. So uh, we decided while everyone has forced downtime, we might as well be productive, right? True. Was a lot of this material left over from like right after the torture test around the same time or stuff that just popped up over the years that you guys were working on? A uh, combination on all of that, actually. We, uh, we dusted a few old ones off. You know? we, we decided to pick the, the tracks that worked together the best for torture tests, but uh, there are a few good ones that didn't quite make it on there. We wouldn't, didn't want to, you know, put 20 songs on a single record. So, you know, a few had to... Uh, be held back, and we thought we'd readjust them, give them some new life, and uh, turn them loose. We combine that. I hear that. Stuff. You know, you know, you've been so busy over the years. You've done so much, whether it was Damage Plan or working with Rob or you know the Mercy Clinic. I mean, was it hard to get back into like a time and place where Diesel Machine was, or did you feel like wherever you guys are now is where the band would have been anyway? Yeah, that's pretty much how it is. We we've always stayed in touch um we're all really good friends and no matter what happens that was our band you know absolutely uh, did it feel like starting over again like this is a whole new thing or did you just everything kind of fall back into place uh, it fell back into place for the most part um you know there was there's was a little apprehension as to what we should do you know if we wanted to change direction or you know um modernize a few things, but I think it was uh, instinct that took over and said, you know, if it ain't broke, don't break it. Let's uh, let's let it be what it is and not worry about critics and just make music for ourselves. True. I mean, to me, torture test, you know, stood the test of time. I mean, the last 20 years, it's still relevant today. I mean, is that just the point of good music? When you're writing good music and you're in the zone, it doesn't matter what decades you're in, what styles are going on right now, what changes, it's still going to hold up and be relevant. Absolutely. You know, and I come from the same era that you do probably where, uh, you know, you like to listen to an album front to back, you know, not just, oh, here's one great song and then a bunch of shit, you know. So I think the best music kind of writes itself. And um, if you don't try too hard, then, uh, you know, it it tends to be more honest and uh, does tend to have that um, test of time. It does. And like it says, yeah, I, I came from that generation where we did play albums start to finish over and over again. And if you didn't like it, you played it until you liked it because you spent about 10 bucks on that record back in the 80s. So you made yourself like that record whether you wanted to or not. But today, these kids, they want to hear one song. And if you don't grab them like within the first 10 seconds, they move on. I mean, that has to make it hard as an artist because you have to write from your heart and what you feel. But you also have to you know, appeal to a certain audience. But is it getting harder and harder to find that audience? I don't think so. I think the the audience finds you typically. And um you know the 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 methodology that record companies took was to sort of be aggressive with the marketing. And I'm not just talking about metal. I'm talking about all genres of music. They just want to ram it down your throat and they never really give it a a chance to grow organically. But I think the reason that you see you know, older bands with a, with a true fan base that are diehards, you know, they'll never stop being a fan because they appreciate your music and because they found you organically, whether it was flipping through vinyl at a shop and, you know, saw your album cover and said, Oh, I got to check this out. You know, it's, it's a, it's an honest discovery of uh, artist and, and fan. And it becomes a lifelong thing for most of us. Yeah. Now with the valve out and everything and ready to go, I mean, are you going to keep this machine running now? Are you going to keep this thing up and going and try to make more out of it? Or is this, you think this is going to be like a one-off and then you guys are going to move on to something else? Uh, it's hard to say, you know, we'd, we'd love to keep uh, cranking out some new stuff. I've always got tons of ideas and, you know, I've got several hard drives worth of music that, uh, you know, could be, could be bent in that direction. You know, or we could just start fresh. It's, uh, you know, the possibilities are endless.
True. I mean, how do you feel about the whole scene in general today? I mean, you know, it splintered over to a lot of different directions, but that also happened back in the 80s and in the 90s. I mean, I feel like every decade it splinters off and one genre is stronger than another. I mean, do you find yourself, I mean, you've like, if you look at everything you've done and been a part of over the years, you've never stayed to one thing. You've always tried different, you know, styles and different genres. It's all been rock and metal, but you've moved around and tried different things. Is it important to be open-minded and to kind of go with what, what's going on if you're into it or just stick with what you want if that's what you're familiar with? Well, it's a question of uh, what opportunities present themselves. You know, Diesel Machine was, um, you know, like I said, an, an honest and organic sort of uh, band with four guys that, moving in the same direction. And uh, when the Halford opportunity popped up for me, uh, it was completely different, but being a huge priest fan, um, you know, I saw an opportunity to work with the metal God, which, uh, you know, I cherish to this day. He's a good friend still. And, uh, you know, it, it didn't take away from what I was doing. Actually, Rob was, uh, he gave us his blessing. He was a fan. He liked the record and everything. That was part of my audition process was sending him that. And, uh, you know, he saw the potential and, uh, you know, so Bouncing around to different things over the years is just, uh, you know, it's like exercising different muscles, but it's all part of the same machine. True. I mean, like you said, going from your own band where you have complete control, or at least, you know, as much control as three or four other guys in the band have together, going to play with, like, Rob, where, you know, you know, he's the guy in the band. Does he let you guys, like, you know, be yourselves and contribute and, and feel like you're in the band and you're contributing a part of it? Or was it more like a high gun thing where you just say, okay, I'm here and I'm enjoying it because of what's going on, but I really want to contribute? No, absolutely. That was, uh, that was the, whole, um, the whole point of me doing that was uh, in, in every band, with every collaboration, with every artist that I've ever played with, um, I had to be part of the writing process because otherwise, you know, you're basically just in a cover band and what's the point? So Rob had made sure. me sort of the uh, de facto uh, musical director, if you will, and I brought a lot of ideas to the table that were completely finished without vocals, of course, and uh, that became the foundation for Resurrection. And, you know, when we, when we wrote together, he was always very open to ideas, and I would throw him lyrics and melodies, and whether they were used in the end or not didn't really matter because it was all part of the creative process just to get the wheels turning. And um, I'm very happy with, uh, with what we did. Yeah, those are some great records that came out, especially at that time, because metal was on the upswing again. You know, we had a couple of down years for certain genres of the music, and that kind of kicked things off again, and it really brought metal back to life and to the forefront again. And, you know, when, when you think back of everything you've been a part of and the choices you've made and the bands you've gone with, was there ever a missed opportunity when you look back on it now saying, oh, I had this opportunity, but I went with this one, I should have did that one? Or is just, are, are there never any regrets? It's just go with what's happening. I think the only regrets I have were not doing enough at the same time, you know, but everybody wants your full attention and everybody wants you to concentrate on a, a single thing. And there's only a certain amount of hours in the day. Um, but I wish I would have aggressively worked on the diesel machine stuff uh, a little more during the time that I was in other projects. Is it is it a market today where you have to be in more than one band if you want to be a musician? You know, unless you're ACDC or Iron Maiden, where that's your primary thing, do you have to be in multiple bands, you know, to kind of make a goal of it today and to keep active? Uh, not necessarily. I think there's a lot of outlets. You know, people people do a lot of licensing, for television, films, and the gaming world, and uh, there's a lot of people doing uh, – marketing, whether it's, you know, guitars or amps or retail related stuff. Um, you know, there's people doing video lessons, Skype lessons, things like that. Uh, I guess today would be Zoom lessons, if you will. But, um, you know, there's plenty of opportunities. But also, if you have uh, enough creativity and you, you want to do different things, uh, you know, I'm totally a, a champion of that cause. Yeah. If I think of, like, you know, Oregon back in the day, so many great bands came out of it, especially the Portland area. I mean, it, was, it, was it as good a scene as we all think it was back then? Because I could name, like, a dozen bands from the area that were just, to me, I loved them back in the day. I mean, was it a happening scene going back on? Did you kill, you know, because this was before the Internet. Or were you feeling kind of isolated, you know, up in the Northwest? I mean, it was definitely a small scene, but it was active, and there were some great bands and some great people. 
Um, you know, it's it sort of over got overshadowed by Seattle, and we would go to shows back in the day, play in Seattle. Um, I, I lived in the Bay Area for a while. You know, there was a scene there too, but it's uh, you know, with the bigger city comes you know, all the difficulties of that, <laughs> the geography, and uh, you know, trying to get around. But uh, we we felt, and my brother and I felt it was our destiny to, to be in Los Angeles because that's where all the record companies are, that's where all the gigs are, that's where the, the media machine resides. So that's where we ended up. Yeah. Uh, no regrets about moving to L.A., I'm guessing, because a lot happened for you there. No, it's uh, it's really my second home. I still love Portland, and I you know love the, the state of Oregon. Um, but, you know... I feel that the West Coast is my home, and uh, L.A. just happens to be the biggest part of it at this point. Yeah. You know, right now, I mean, you know, with the whole coronavirus thing, everybody's sort of, you know, kind of on the down. There's not, no shows really taking place, at least here in the New York area. There's nothing going on in New Jersey. I, I know it's spread out like that throughout the country. There's little places here and there. I mean, what does an artist do? Is this just the time to kind of catch up on the writing and recording process for things you're doing, or... Is there any opportunity to get out and play anywhere for you or Diesel Machine right now? Um, as far as playing out with crowds, that's that's really something that has not been solved yet. Um, there's a lot of liability that comes with putting people together. And, you know, unfortunately, in, in the business world, we have insurance companies to deal with and promoters and things like that. So, mm. um, you know, what I'd like to see is something – like what Lamb of God did where, you know, we all get together and jam and just, uh, you know, do a live stream type thing. The, the live streams seem to be getting bigger and bigger now. I mean, you know, you have to kind of take advantage of every opportunity that's out there, you know, for people to hear you. And I'm seeing more and more bands doing live shows, I guess, in, you know, isolated venues or places they could play at and, you know, charging a few dollars or putting it up there. You think this is going to be the wave of the future? Do you think this is actually going to take over live performances if it doesn't come back in the next year? I don't think anything can take over for live performances, but I think this is a good supplement for it. I mean, we, we have to do what we have to do at the moment. And, uh, you know, we'll overcome this one way or another. Um, you know, but it, it does go back to the early days. You know, think of yourself as a teenager trying to sneak into a show that wasn't all ages or, you know, <laughs> just the, the struggle yep. to get to a show. You know, get, get in a, mow enough lawns to make uh, enough money to buy a ticket and, and find a ride, you know, before there was uh, – you know, you couldn't get mom's car or there was no Uber or <laughs> that kind of shit. <laughs> yeah, right. true. I mean, I, I mean, like I said, we come from the same generation. We've been around just as long as each other. I mean, is it has it been easy for you to adapt? Do you adapt, I should say, easily to the changes that come in the music business? You know, where record companies are once king now, bands do everything on their own. The technology to be able to record a record in, in your living room. You know, we're, we're all we're members all over the world if you want to. I mean, is there anything you miss about the old way of doing things, or are you just that kind of guy that goes with all the new technology and adapts very easily to it? Uh, well, you know, technology comes with its own dangers. <laughs> That's probably why it took us uh, this long to get this diesel machine record out, uh, because you have the luxury of time. You're not paying for it. So I think there's a, there's a certain motivation, you know, when you go into a, an analog studio and you don't have a giant record company budget to sit around and uh, order sushi. You know, you go in there and you knock it out and you got to know your, know your songs and you got to have a, a solid idea of what you want and then get in there and get it done. And, uh, you know, that's that's kind of how Torture Test was. We essentially just, you know, let the songs be what they were. And uh, we found the best mixer that we could to get it done. And uh, that was Pat Regan, and he did an incredible job. I listened to the production today, and I still go, wow, that's, that sounds so good for how shitty our budget was and how much time we spent on it. It, it really turned out excellent. And uh, that's kind of how the new one is. But we did it all ourselves, and, you know, we had to, uh, Chris Collier come in and, uh, you give it a little shine at the end to sort of modernize the, the production, I guess. And uh, I think it's on par with what's, what's happening today um, sonically. And, uh, yeah, we're all pretty satisfied with the finished product. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Start to finish, how long did you put into this album? <laughs> uh, decades. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess you had an exact question, right? But I mean, you know, I mean, you really got rolling with it. I mean, was it like a, a long process after you finally got the ball rolling, or did it all kind of gel together once, you know, you said, hey, let's do it? 
Well, funny enough, I mean, the <laughs> it evolved, <laughs> pun intended. Um, yeah. Like I said, some of the songs. Well, some of the songs were like one of the. I guess uh, "Anger Within" was probably the first song we wrote as a band, and uh, you know, there was at some point there was a consensus that it felt a bit slow, and we maybe we should have something a little more, you know, upbeat, but. It, it never got old up, so we wanted to put it out. And, uh, you know, that was kind of a bit of the, the crowbar influence, I guess you would say. AJ and I really were into that band early on. Um, but essentially, um, you know, as the process moved forward, we said we, we want to take these old songs and sort of you know, give them some new life, and then we added some, some new material. And uh, so it, it sort of came in chunks. And uh, eventually we said, okay, we just got to make this, have some continuity and put it together and finish it once and for all. So it really yeah. did evolve into what it is now. When you sit back, you play the final product, if you do play it like in, in its entirety after it's already done. I mean, how do you look at it then? Because, you know, when you're that close to it and you're working on the songs day in and day out, you're recording them, you know, you kind of, I guess it's like it could be, it could kind of lose a little bit of the meaning of what the song's about when you're working on bits and pieces of it. When you hear the whole thing in its entirety, you sit back and say, damn, you know, we did a good job on this. I mean, it came out the way we wanted. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I always had those moments of, oh, shit, I wish I would have, you know, blank. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, there's nothing you can do. Once, you, once it's out of your hands, you just have to live with it and let it be what it is. Um, I've had that experience on every album that I've made, even the ones that haven't come out yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, when you when you look listen to back to anything that you've done over the years, do you hear like that one big note or that one thing that you really was supposed to be that you didn't catch when you recorded it and it just sticks with you and you say, Damn, I just, I'm never gonna stop hearing that note. Yeah, of course there's always uh little mistakes or, or even happy mistakes that uh you go, Wow, I d I didn't even intend to do that and it turned out great. Or, uh, you know, it's just a, a combination of how different people interact. You know, someone puts their part down and you go, oh, that's, that's not what I would have done. But, you know, that sounds fucking great. So, you know, it can go <laughs> both ways. True. Hey, Pat, I'm not going to keep it. I know you got a lot of these things to do today. You did an amazing job with Evolve. I hope you give us a new one, you know, in the next couple of years. I don't know if I'll be around in 20 more. But, uh, you know, work on that <laughs> while you got downtime right now. I would love to hear another one because I've already been playing Absolutely. the shit out of this one. Very nice. The best of luck, my friend. And I hope I get you back out on the road soon and maybe get Diesel Machine over here to the New York area. Love to see you live. I would love to do that. Pleasure talking with you today, okay. sir. Pat, take care. Take Good care. talking to you. Bye-bye.